In this presentation, we will take a look at and consider some of the teachings of the final book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. As always, before listening to this presentation, I would encourage you to read the scriptures, the verses, prior to that so you're familiar with the detail and the background and the storyline, and I think you'll gain a lot more out of it. So, an introduction. As we have observed with so many of the prophets, little is known of the life of Malachi, apart what can be learned in his book. And many scholars of our day even suppose that the prophecy is anonymous, since Malachi in Hebrew means my messenger. Therefore, the author of the last book of the Old Testament was written by God's messenger, whom we do not know the name of. However, because of Latter-day Scripture, um, uh, Latter-day Scripture, Latter-day Saints know better and have a more sure word. When the resurrected Savior visited this continent, according to the account in the Book of Mormon, he delivered to the ancient Nephites the two last two chapters of Malachi's prophecy and explained their significance. Preliminary to quoting the text, the ancient historian Mormon writes the following words. And it came to pass that he, Christ, commanded them that they should write the words which the Father had given unto Malachi, which he should tell unto them. And it came to pass that after they were written, he expounded them. And these are the words which he did say unto them, saying, Thus say the Father unto Malachi. Then follows the text of Malachi 3 through 4. The point is clear as far as we is concerned. The Savior would surely not quote the prophecies that come from Malachi if he did not actually write it. And so it's interesting at how modern revelation can clear up years of misunderstood and wrongly <clears throat> decided events of the scriptures by scholars, by academia. And so we know that Malachi was a real prophet, that was his name, and he did indeed write these books, these chapters. The great biblical scholar, Sidney B. Sperry, said, according to synagogue tradition, Malachi lived after the prophets Haggai and Zechariah and was a contemporary of Nehemiah. It is clear from the prophecy that the temple had been completed, and moreover, enough years had passed by to see the Jews become worldly and neglect towards their spiritual duties. The priest should whom I'm, let me try it again. I apologize. The priest who should have led and taught their people correct principles were themselves corrupt and guilty of being partial in their administration of the law. Many marriages with the heathen women of the land were taking place, and men were guilty of divorcing their wives unjustly. Improper sacrifices were being offered up contrary to the letter and spirit of the law of Moses. Failure to pay tithings and offerings is also mentioned. The book seems to make clear that the Jews were living under a pekach, or Persian governor, who was kind to them. These facts and others not mentioned lead to us to believe that Malachi was written during the reign of Artaxerxes I, king of Persia, or sometime between 464 B.C. and 421 B.C. I tentatively date the book at 450 B.C. Malachi divides naturally into two parts, the first of these comprising chapters 1 and 2 deals with situations that confronted Malachi in his own day. The second, comprised of the last two chapters, deals in part with matters yet future in relation to Malachi's own time. In fact, the prophet deals with certain important events pertaining to the opening scenes of this dispensation. All of this helps explain why the Savior, in quoting part of Malachi to the Nephites, used the last two chapters. These deal with matters of greater significance and interest to them and future generations than those of Malachi's own day portrayed in the first two chapters. So with that, 
Let's begin with Malachi chapter 1, and we'll start by taking a look at verses 2 through 5. In here we see the proof of the Lord's love for his people. Chapter 1, verses 2 through 5, the Lord answers Israel's fancied question, Wherein hast thou loved us? He points out that Esau, here representative of Edom, was Jacob's, or Israel's, brother. But Jacob he loved, and Esau he hated. The word hated in Hebrew means to be loved less than someone else, not to be disliked with bitter hostility. Esau was the brother of Jacob, who became Israel, father of the twelve tribes. Students of the scriptures know that the Lord hates the sin rather than the sinner. But when people array themselves against the Lord as Esau and his descendants, the Edomites, had done for centuries, the Lord would draw his blessings. In this sense, Jacob was loved and Esau hated. So completely was the rejection of the Lord by Esau's descendants that they came to symbolize to the prophets the wickedness of, humil of humanity in general. See Doctrine and Covenants, Covenants 1 verse 36. Before Malachi's time, they were known as Edomites or Edomians, and their place of habitation was known as Edom. Jacob stood as a symbol for Israel, or the chosen people, while Esau, Edom, symbolized the world. This gives the Lord's statement much broader meaning. So we also see in here that God loves those who follow him and hates, or loves less, as we've already described in here, those who follow after the world which is shown in that he can't bless those who follow after the things of the world like he can bless those who follow his will. So in that those terms also is why he loves the wicked and those who follow the world less. I, I, I can't bless you. I, the Lord, am bound when you do what I say, but when you do not what I say, you have no promise. I, I, I cannot bless you. It is a fact of history that during exi Israel's exile in Babylon, Edom was conquered by the Nabataeans, and their continued bondage is clearly reflected in verses 3 through 5. The lines distinct distinctly reveal God's love for Israel and her divine election. If this love seems unfair, let it be remembered that God's choices are based on character and performance. Between Israel and Edom, his choice was historically justified. Israel, not always, but Israel followed Jehovah. Edom did not. Let's now turn to Malachi chapter 1. Oh, let's get the gospel principle with the proof of the Lord's love for his people. Jehovah's love is sufficient for all those who willingly come unto him and partake of his gospel. If you want the Lord's love in terms of a verb, in terms of saving us, in terms of overcoming the natural mind, not as a noun that God just loves us as a thing, that's, that's unconditional, but as a verb, then we must partake of the gospel upon the conditions of repentance where we receive mercy and the blessings of Jehovah's love and God's love. Malachi chapter 1, verse 6 through chapter 2, verse 10. Malachi, now Israel is condemned for her faithlessness. Let's take a look at this. Chapter 1, verse 6. Malachi now berates the people, and especially the priests, for the lack of honor and respect accorded God. Israel not only has questioned his love, but has stooped to such low actions that even his majesty or authority, his name, is at stake. So that's what verse 6 is explaining. Chapter 1, verse 7 is talking about the people and priests have despised Jehovah by offering polluted bread, sacrificial offerings generally, not just the bread offering, upon God's altar in the temple. How have they polluted Jehovah? 
Well, their offerings to God have become common and worthless, contemptible, inasmuch as the sacrifices that they made for the people typified the coming sacrifice and atonement of the Son of God, the only acceptable sacrifice was that which was spotless. They were now offering animals that were blind and decrepit and full of deformity, didn't point to Christ whatsoever, which shows their inner heart and what they really thought of Jehovah. Chapter 1, verse 8. Malachi is concerned over this behavior. The prophet points out how cheap and without conscience Israel's worship has become. The Lord is despised, he declares, because polluted bread is offered upon his altar, not to mention sick, lame, and blind animals, then the letter and spirit of the law of Moses have required the finest, or when the letter and spirit of the law of Moses have required the finest. Would even their Persian governor accept these as a gift? Well, the answer is obviously no. Not even a Gentile would accept that. The priests and Levites of Malachi's day were mocking God by offering such sacrifices to the Lord. They had no reverence for what they were doing. So you can see why they're going to lose out on blessings. Remember, God will not be mocked. Chapter 1, verse 9, Malachi fears that God's graciousness will not be with them since they have done this openly by their means. Did they think Jehovah would accept this? I believe, yes, some actually believe that. Yeah, we can get away with this. We, why else would you do it unless you thought, ah, he won't notice or he won't care? He won't care if our hearts are set upon the things of the world and we despise him. That's how foolish their thought process had become. Chapter 1, verse 10. Malachi believes it would be far better for the doors of the temple to be shut than for such sacrifices to be burnt. They had no reverence for that what they were doing. The Lord told them, I have no pleasure in you, neither will I accept any offering at your hand. They were selfish and worldly, and not one of them would kindle a fire on the heathen of on the hearth of the altar unless he were paid for it. That's what it means for not. And I offer sacrifice unless you pay me, the priests. You see how far they have slipped? Malachi's teaching is highly applicable even to our own day. We may build inexpensive houses of worship, but let not our worship be cheap and unworthy. We may build temples economically, but let us not work in them without a due sense of the dignity and respect that God requires. Is our worship cheap? Or does it cost us something? Because, brothers and sisters, the Savior's atonement was not cheap. It cost him something. So let not our worship be cheap. Chapter 1, verse 11. Malachi is making a contrast between the smallest and contempt in which his own people hold God and the reverence and respect paid him by the heathen. It is most interesting to note that the offerings of the heathen are quite acceptable. Malachi would have his people know that in proportion to their light and knowledge of God, the heathen nations were as good or as or better than Israel. So when you compare to what they know, remember where much is given, much is required, much has been given to Israel, and much is required of them, but they are giving far less. Now, what even the heathens who don't even believe in Jehovah are giving to respect for at least a God. Therefore, in that sense, they are better off and love God more than Israel does. Chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. The Lord had been insulted. The table on which the offerings were made was polluted. The offering itself was contemptible. Such action, Malachi promised, would result in cursing rather than blessing, for God's name is terrible, meaning it should be had in reverence. 
they were not reverencing him. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The Lord promises are conditional. How could the priesthood of Malachi's day enjoy the Spirit and find success in their labors unless they are worthy? The priests are particularly admonished. To do so was timely and appropriate, for if the religious leaders of the people felt in their duties and responsibilities to God, how could the masses be expected to comply with the requirements of the good life? The priests were told to give glory to God, or in other words, to mend their ways and change their attitudes. And if they did not receive this commandment, called in verse 4, my covenant with Levi, they were to be cursed. If you have the ruling leaders and the, the priestly class, the priesthood being contemptible, how else do you think the people are going to respond? Chapter 2, verses 5 through 6, At first, the tribe of Levi had walked uprightly before him, that is, before Jehovah. Chapter 2, verse 7, The priests were not only reverent, irreverent, I should be irreverent, I apologize for the spelling error there, and slack in their worship, but are failing to live up to their intellectual responsibilities. Of all people who should gain knowledge and seek to improve their intellectual talents, it is those who are in the service of God. Well, that's applicable today, brethren of the priesthood. Those who bear the holy priesthood should be knowledge of the priesthood and the gospel which they represent. We should learn about the gospel and his church. There is no reason for lack of gospel scholarship among a priesthood holder or any member of the church. George Adam Smith, a biblical scholar, said, Religion needs all the brains which we mortals can put into it. There is a priesthood of knowledge, a priesthood of the intellect, says Malachi. And he makes this part of God's covenant with Levi. Every priest of God is a priest of truth. And it is largely by the Christian ministry's neglect of their intellectual duties that much irreligion prevails. We should be a priesthood of intellectual gospel knowledge, brethren. How many priesthood meetings have you been to? And either the doctrine is so skewed or so misunderstood that it's a wonder this church survives. And as Elder Joseph Fielding Smith has said in response to what George Adam Smith said, not only brains that we should have, but the guidance of the Spirit of the Lord, which every member of the church is entitled to receive if he righteously seeks it. So at least in the church we have an added benefit of the gift of the Holy Ghost that we should be using in coming to learn doctrine. Chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. By departing from the ways of their fathers, they had neutralized or broken the covenant originally made with God. He then spelled out the sins of Judah and her priesthood. The latter, for example, had caused many to stumble at the law by rendering unjust and immoral decisions, thus bringing them to the spiritual destruction and ruin. See verse 8. See one of the problems when you don't understand doctrine? Or you corrupt it? When compared with the instructions to the Levites set forth in Deuteronomy chapter 33 verses 8 through 11, such conduct falls short of God's intended standard. For this reason, they were contemptible to the people rather than loved by them as the Lord had intended. That's what verses 8 and 9 are about. Well, well, no wonder you would hold the priesthood in contempt and you wouldn't look up to it. If they can't guide and direct in true doctrine, then why would you hold them in esteem? Gospel principle. Only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ can we have access to his grace. Their faith was waning. Therefore, they did not receive of his grace as they could have. 
Let's now go to Malachi chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. A protest against foreign marriages and divorce are discussed. As a result of the failure of the priest to judge and lead in righteousness, Judah had fallen once again into a serious sin. She had profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughters of a strange god. That's Malachi 2.11. This passage calls to mind again the often used figure in the Old Testament of the husband, Jehovah, and the wife, Judah or Israel. As solemn a bond or covenant exists between Jehovah and Israel as exists between a husband and his wife. But Judah had chosen another partner, the daughter of a strange God, meaning that Judah had formed a temporal or spiritual alliance with a nation that did not regard Jehovah as the Lord of heaven. That is one of the dangers of marrying out of the covenant, is that your spouse will influence you to worship something other than the true God and not regard Christ as we should. The master and the scholar, verse 12, is he who teaches such doctrine, profaning the Lord by marrying women who worship idols, and he who follows it. They will both be cut off. Marrying out of the covenant, or marrying even in the covenant and then not living up to it as either partner, is worshiping idols. And if you marry someone who's not in the covenant and has the same beliefs, not just the same beliefs because of religion, but the same beliefs in the truth, that's what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is and offers, then you're going to be cut off from the truth. One of the gross sins among the ancient people of the Lord was unfaithfulness in marriage vows. Some of the Hebrew men, tiring of their wives and mothers of their children, were seeking companionship of younger women. Oh my gosh, you would think he was describing 2022. The wives would come to, the wives would come to the temple and make an appeal to God at the altar. In this unfaithfulness to marriage vows, the Lord declared, the men had dealt treacherously. See verse 13 and 14. The Lord was angry with these men because they did not remain true to their wives. But he also expressed anger towards the priest for knowing the problem and not executing justice. They did nothing. They did not teach the proper doctrine. He told the men to scrutinize their innermost feelings towards the woman whom they had loved in their youth, who had borne their children, and who had loved and served them and not put away their wives. Verse 15. For the Lord hateth putting away. Verse 16. So they were cheating and putting away their wives and divorcing merely for the fact that they had grown tired of their wives as they got older and wanted younger women. Yet that's going to go over well in Christ's church and worshiping Christ. This is kind of goes along with what Jacob said in the Book of Mormon, Jacob 2, 31 through 33, 35. They had a similar problem in the Nephites. For behold, I, the Lord, have seen the sorrow and heard the mourning of the daughters of my people in the land of Jerusalem, yea, in all the lands of my people, because of the wickedness and abominations of their husbands. And I will not suffer, saith the Lord of hosts, that the cries of the fair daughters of this people which I have led out of the land of Jerusalem, shall come up unto me against the men of my people, saith the Lord of hosts. For they shall not lead away captive the daughters of my people because of their tenderness. Save I shall visit them with a sore curse, even unto destruction. For they shall not commit whoredoms like unto them of old, saith the Lord of hosts. So you, like those in Jerusalem in Malachi's day, are not treating your daughters and your wives properly. The last general conference, the first talk out of the senior apostle's mouth, the one who holds all of the keys of the priesthood to guide and direct this church. And he warns us and tells us the church to knock off our abuse to one another.
children, wives, husbands. That is not a good sign in the latter days of how we're doing in our marriages and in our families, whether that is emotional, mental, verbal, or physical abuse. Knock it off. Behold, ye have done greater iniquities than the Lamanites. This is now continuing Jacob's um, quote. Ye have broken the hearts of your tender wives and lost the confidence of your children. I think that's why President Nelson said what he said. The same is happening today. Back to Jacob. Because of your bad examples before them and the sobbings of their hearts ascend up to God against you. Well, may we consider wisely our marriages, brothers and sisters, both husband and wives, and how we're treating each other. Now let's turn to Malachi chapter 2, verse 17. It's kind of a key in the rest of the book of Malachi. Malachi 2, 17 is really a reiteration of the Lord's displeasure with faithless Israel and provides a reason presenting the matter that follows in chapters 3 and 4 of Malachi. Here it is. Here is Mount 2.17. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet you say, in, wherein, wherein, wherein have we wearied him? In that ye say, Every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or where is the God of justice? So they have gone far astray thinking that what they're doing is good in the sight of the Lord. And he delights in Israel. No. Malachi say, oh, where is the God of justice? This is not just what you are doing and what you're going to do in the future. The prophet is saddened, as these words show, but the, by the low spiritual state of his people. He sees a day in the future when the question to the answer, where is the God of justice, will be answered with vengeance. God will show us justice, brothers and sisters. God will execute judgment for the wickedness of this earth. The Israelites of that day, latter-day Israel, meaning latter-day Israel, will be tried and refined, but out of their experience, great good to the human race shall result. And so we are being tried and refined through great tribulation. There is great judgments upon the land. You, you don't think a lot of the destruction and problems that we have and the rampant immorality and the rampant trafficking of human beings and sexuality and all of this and the destruction it caused the, the drug destruction that we have the wars don't you think this is God's judgment upon a people who will not hearken you want to be unfaithful fine I will give you I will give you a society what and shows you what it likes to be unfaithful I'll let you wallow in immorality and see what that society looks like. And so we have it. Well, now let's turn to Malachi chapter 3. The last two chapters, probably referring more to our day then. Malachi 3, verses 1 through 5, the coming of a messenger to prepare the way of the Lord. Malachi 3, 1. One of the messengers sent to prepare the way of the Lord at his coming was John the Baptist. John's mission was performed in the spirit and power of the priesthood of Elias. See Luke 1.17. Elias is a name for a forerunner, one who goes before or prepares the way for someone or something greater. So maybe you say Elias, not just name, but Elias is a title for a forerunner, someone who prepares the way. In that sense, the Aaronic priesthood is the priesthood of Elias because it, prayer, it prepares and qualifies individuals for greater blessings and prepares them for the greater priesthood, the Melchizedek. Joseph Smith explained, the spirit of Elias is to prepare the way for a greater revelation of God, which is the priesthood of Elias, or the priesthood that Aaron was ordained unto. 
And when God sets a man into the world to prepare for a greater work, holding the keys of the power of Elias, it was called the doctrine of Elias, even from the early ages of the world. So Joseph is trying to explain to us, as Malachi is saying, that, hey, in the future, you're going to have one who has the title of Elias, meaning they are a preparer, prepare people for greater blessings than just Aaronic priesthood blessings, but he will be Aaronic priesthood holder. And that prepares people. Just like John the Baptist, Aaronic priesthood holder, prepared the way for the ministry of Jesus Christ. So who is this messenger that's come in the latter days? Well, let's consider that. Joseph Smith was also an Elias in that he was a forerunner, one who prepared the way, who laid the foundation for the second coming through the rest of the duration of the gospel. But that's not the messenger that's referred to in chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, and particularly verse 1. It's not Joseph Smith. Yes, Joseph Smith prepared the way, and still is. But the messenger they're talking about is somebody different in Malachi 3.1. In the meridian of time, that's the time of Christ, the way was prepared by John for the messenger of the covenant himself to come and bring the greater blessings. See Matthew 3, 1 through 3 and 11 through 12. He who was mightier than John and followed after him to baptize with fire and the Holy Ghost was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is called the messenger of the covenant because he mediates the gospel of salvation unto men. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, Our Lord is the messenger of the covenant. He came in his Father's name, bearing his Father's message, to fulfill the covenant of the Father that a Redeemer and a Savior would be provided for. Also, through his ministry, the terms of the everlasting covenant of salvation became operative. The message he taught was that salvation came through the gospel covenant. So John prepares the way for the messenger of the covenant, for Jesus Christ. Malachi is saying in the latter days, that will be repeated. Who is the messenger that's coming in chapter 3 of Malachi verse 1? It is John the Baptist. Does he not come back again to Joseph Smith? See, before Aaronic priesthood is given, before we have any temple or any of that, Joseph Smith is visited by John the Baptist, and he gives them the Aaronic priesthood in preparation to all else that is coming. So just as John the Baptist was the Elias or the preparer at the time of Christ in the New Testament, John the Baptist is also the messenger who prepares the way for the second coming of Christ in the latter days. John the Baptist comes to Joseph Smith. And that prepares the way for all the rest of the blessings of the church to be restored. John is that messenger, John the Baptist. When he comes to earth a second time, he will make more than one appearance before he comes in the clouds of heaven. This is referring to Christ. For all flesh shall see him together. At least one of those appearances includes a sudden visit to his temple, yet to be built in Jackson County, Missouri. Elder McConkie stated, Malachi recorded the promise, speaking of latter-day events, that the Lord whom you, suddenly, whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Certainly the Almighty is not limited in the number of appearances and returns to the earth needed to fulfill the scriptures, usher in the final dispensation, and consummate his great latter-day work. The sudden latter-day appearance in the temple does not have reference to his appearance at the great and dreadful day, for that coming will be when he sets his foot upon the Mount of Olivet in the midst of the final great war. Okay, so the suddenly coming to his temple is not that experience. The temple appearance was fulfilled, in part at least, by his return to the Kirtland Temple on April 3rd, 1836. And it may well be that he will come again suddenly to others of his temple, more particularly that which will be erected in Jackson County, Missouri. So, in these verses 1 through 5, we says Christ will suddenly come to his temple. 
has dual meaning. One, yes, it was fulfilled when he suddenly came to the temple on the dedication of the Kirtland Temple. You can see that in section Doctrine and Covenants 110. But, Ellen McConkie is suggesting that that will also have another fulfillment when he will suddenly come to his temple in Jackson County, Missouri. This is all prior to what we call his second coming and his millennial reign. That's why the second coming is not next week. It's not next year. We do not have a temple in Jackson County, Missouri for him to suddenly come to yet. In this connection, it is worthy of note that when and whether the Lord appears, he will come suddenly, that is quickly, in an hour you think not. His oft-repeated warning, behold, I come quickly, means that when that appointed hour arrives, he will come with a speed and a suddenness which will leave no further time for preparation for that great day. See, now that's an important definition. You'll read constantly in the Doctrine and Covenants where he says, Behold, I come quickly. Behold, I come quickly. Brothers and sisters, those prophecies, those sections were given over a hundred years ago. That's not very quick to me. What he means is that when Christ does come, it will just happen very quickly. He's not going to slowly descend for his second coming, okay, out of the clouds of heaven, and it's going to take three years for him to descend, meaning you have time now to go to your bishop and repent. No, it will happen suddenly. It will happen quickly. When the event comes, it will come. Boom. Done. Over. Time's out. You're done. You should have repented. That's what it means, behold, I come quickly. Malachi 3, verses 2 through 3. Jesus Christ was to come in his glory and rule for a thousand years over his saints. But before that event, there should be great judgments in the earth, and more especially at his appearance. Consequently, he would be, as the scriptures say, like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Here, a good opportunity to impress the importance of having the righteous people of the earth duly warned and prepare for the judgments to come. So, a lot of the destruction and tragedies and things that we are going through are to refine us, are to clean us up. Either I become wicked and I'm caught up in the judgments, or I see that and I say, I want no part of that. I want to be protected from that. And so, I will repent and follow the will of God, and keep my covenants in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is a protection. But we are going to have such events, and things in society are going to get so bad that it will be like a refining fire. You will need the gift of the Holy Ghost if you're going to survive in these last days. We're going to need his guidance. That can only come to a righteous people. Sidney B. Sperry said, Now the question arises as to whom Malachi is referring when he mentions the sons of Levi, who are to be purged as gold and silver, that they might offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Moroni undoubtedly expounded it to all the young prophets. Back, I'm sorry, expounded it all to the young prophet. And when we are fortunate in, in finding the answer to our query in the Doctrine and Covenants, once when in an exalted mood, the prophet wrote as follows. Remember Moroni, what he's referring to here is Moroni, when he comes to Joseph Smith, remember in 1823, three years after the first vision, when he's praying in his room, Moroni shows up. He quotes the stuff of Malachi. And probably explains it all. Joseph never, Joseph says he, he quoted the verses from Malachi and then expounded them. And, and, and we don't have that. Wish we did. So here's what the prophet Joseph Smith wrote. Behold, the great day of the Lord is at hand. And who can abide the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appeareth? For he is like a fire's refine, a refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. 
Let us, therefore, as a church and a people of Latter-day Saints, offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness, and let us present in his holy temple, when it is finished, a book containing the records of our dead, or shall be worthy of all acceptation. Okay, that quote is from Doctrine and Covenants 128-24 that I just quoted you, that Joseph said. We, as the sons of Levi, when we take on the priesthood brethren, we are becoming like Moses and Aaron, who held the Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthood. That's all it's saying. And what is the acceptable sacrifice that we will offer? It will be the finished book of the records of doing the temple work for our dead. So that's one of them. The answer is clear and unmistakable because the passage of Malachi, which we have been considering, is given along with it. The Latter-day Saints, as a church and a people, are the ones who are to offer up an offering in righteousness in the temple in the form of a book containing the records of our dead. We are now performing functions that will be required of the sons of Levi when they come into the church. In a figurative sense, we may be called sons of Levi. That this conclusion is correct is made even more clearly by another reference in the Doctrine and Covenants. In the Doctrine and Covenants, section 84, verses 31 through 34, the Lord says, Therefore, as I said concerning the sons of Moses, for the sons of Moses and all the sons of Aaron shall offer an acceptable offering and sacrifice in the house of the Lord, which house shall be built unto the Lord in this generation upon the consecrated spot as I have appointed. And the sons of Moses and Aaron shall be filled with the glory of the Lord upon Mount Zion in the Lord's house, whose sons ye are. For whosoever is faithful in obtaining these two priests of which I have spoken and the magnifying their callings are sanctified by the Spirit unto the renewing of their bodies. They become the sons of Moses and of Aaron, the seed of Abraham, the church and kingdom, the elect of God. You see, when we, brethren, take upon the priesthood, we then become the sons of Moses and Aaron. We are like them. We now hold the priesthood that they held. So that's why he refers to it that way. Part of verse 31 seems to be an allusion to Malachi 3.1 in that it refers to an acceptable offering. That is an offering in righteousness. A point of doctrine not generally noticed in the church is that those who hold the priesthood are called the sons of Moses and of Aaron. That is to say, they are to all intents sons of Levi, since both Moses and Aaron were literal descendants of Levi. In a sermon on priesthood, the prophet Joseph Smith points out that the ordinance of sacrifice as existed before the days of Moses will be performed by the sons of Levi as a part of the acceptable offering. Those who presently hold the Aaronic and Melchizedek priests are indeed the sons of Levi in a certain sense and are among the ones whom Malachi apparently had in mind when he gave this great prophecy. We have no wish to exclude any of the literal descendants of Levi who may later come into the church and perform temple work. It is possible then that Moroni began his explanation of temple work and of salvation for the dead in connection with the third chapter of Malachi, rather than with the fourth chapter as so many persons in the church commonly suppose. There is there is more than one meaning for the offering of righteousness. Remember, section 128 makes it clear that that offering righteousness that the sons of Moses and Aaron, the sons of Levi, will make is by offering up our records, the temple records, of those ordinances we've performed for the dead. But now I'm suggesting there's more than one meaning to what does it mean to offer an offering in righteousness? to be made by the sons of Levi at or near the second coming of the Lord. With regard to animal sacrifice, Joseph Smith said the following. It is generally supposed that the sacrifice, that sacrifice, meaning animal sacrifice, was entirely done away when the great sacrifice, that is, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus was offered up, and that there will be no necessity for the ordinance of sacrifice in the future. But those who assert this are not certain, 
who assert this are certainly not acquainted with the duties, privileges, and authority of the priesthood or with the prophets. See, Joseph is suggesting there then that in the restitution of all things, even animal sacrifice will one day be restored and performed again in his temple. The offering of sacrifice has ever been connected and forms a part of the duties of the priesthood. It began with the priesthood and it will continue until after the coming of Christ from generation to generation. We frequently have men mention made of the offering of sacrifice by the servants of the Most High in ancient days prior to the law of Moses which ordinance will be continued when the priesthood is restored with all its authority, power, and blessings. So remember, President Nelson said we're still in the restoration. We haven't restored all things yet. We haven't restored the offering of sacrifice of animals. Which, which, which offering was made prior? We're not talking about the law of Moses. No, just the offering of animal sacrifice, which was done long before the law of Moses. Adam did it. Abraham did it. Continuing Joseph Smith, these sacrifices, as well as every ordinance belonging to the priesthood, will, when the temple of the Lord shall be built, and the sons of Levi be purified, be fully restored and attended to in all their powers, ramifications, and blessings. This ever did and ever will exist when the powers of the Melchizedek priesthood are sufficiently manifest. Else how can the restitution of all things spoken of by the holy prophets be brought to pass? It is not to be understood. Is it not to be understood that the law of Moses? Uh, let me try one more time. It is not to be understood that the law of Moses will be established again with all its rites and various of ceremonies. This has never been spoken of by the prophets. But those things which existed prior to Moses' day, namely sacrifice, will be continued. Brothers and sisters, we do not do that in the church. That must be restored prior to Christ's coming. His second coming is not next week. It's not next year. It's probably not two years. I haven't seen that restored in the church yet. Would it be surprising if he doesn't come within 50 or even 100 years, brothers and sisters? I know, I know, President Nelson said time is running out. But put that in context of ever since Adam left the Garden of Eden and became mortal, time was running out. Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. Malachi, because his second coming is going to be, the, the events will be so horrific that they'll be like a refining fire. He asked the question, then, who may abide the day of his coming? Who's going to get through that? Well, let's take a look at some of the answers. The Lord's return to earth in his glory will be a great and dreadful day. As John the Baptist told the Jews, the Savior will gather in the wheat, meaning the righteous, and the chaff, the wicked, he will burn with unquenchable fire. The only ones who will survive will be those who have kept their covenants with the Lord, or who are worthy at least a paradisiacal or terrestrial glory. All wickedness will be destroyed from the earth. All telestial wickedness will be destroyed from the earth. Well, we're going to go through some horrific events because it says it's dreadful. One, we've already got the key here. Those who keep their covenants will be able to abide. What else? Habakkuk gives us an insight. Habakkuk chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 says this. This is after Habakkuk has asked a couple of questions of Jehovah. One, look, look at all the unjust treatment of the people in Jerusalem. And why, and Habakkuk's been praying and pleading about it and God hasn't answered them. And what are you going to do about it? And then Jehovah responds by saying, well, I'm sending the Chaldeans to come in and destroy Jerusalem and the people of Israel and Judah because of their wickedness. And they'll be carried captive into Babylon. And then Habakkuk says, hold it. Why, why do you use a wicked nation? Certainly, Jerusalem, those are more righteous than this. They, they were known for their wickedness and their idolatry worship. 
why would you use a nation more wicked than what we are to punish us? And Jehovah says, look, you do, there's a plan to what I am doing. And then he says this, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me. In other words, Malachi says, okay, I don't understand it all right now, so I'll wait and wait upon the Lord. I'll watch to see what he does and what I shall answer when I am reproved. I'm willing to wait and watch the Lord's hand in this. Just because he didn't get an answer to prayer, he doesn't get offended and leave. Many in the church do that, and that will be to their own detriment. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run, that readeth it, meaning it may be easily read. That's what it means by that he may run, that readeth it. For the vision is not yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. I will not tarry. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. Yes, destruction is coming upon Jerusalem. Things are coming. There is a plan to this. I'm going to use the wicked to kill the wicked. And don't worry. In due time, Babylon will also be conquered and receive their just judgments for being wicked. I've taken all the account. And this is going to be horrible to go through. But the one thing you can be assured of, Habakkuk, is the just shall live by faith. That's who's going to get through this terrible destruction. Just like those back then anciently for Habakkuk, Today, who will abide the day of Christ's coming? Those who lived by faith. Well, what is faith? Faith is doing what God wants, when God wants it done, and how God wants it done, regardless of the outcome. Faith is not... Let, let's get rid of the silly notion in this church that I hear way too much. And you're just setting yourself up for failure. Let's get rid of the silly notion that faith is believing hard enough in something and it will happen. No, no, that's not it. I hear some people, well, if I just believe harder. I don't even know what that phrase means. To believe harder. Do you? That makes no sense. No, faith is doing the will of God. Faith is doing what he wants when he wants it done, and how he wants it done, regardless of the outcome. Now, the reason I added that, regardless of the outcome, because, brothers and sisters, it takes faith to die. Maybe more so than it does to live and be healed of an incurable disease. Google sometime a talk that Elder Bednar gave where he refers to a young couple who the husband, they've only been married for like a week or two or three, and he's diagnosed with cancer. And they're devastated. And it's a deadly cancer. And he happens to be talking to this couple, and they ask him for a blessing. He said, that's fine, I'll be glad to give you a blessing, but I feel impressed to ask you one question. Do you have enough faith to die? Well, do we? If that's what God wants done, and faith is doing what God wants done, when he wants it and how he wants it, do you have enough faith to die? That is a great question. See, Abinadi, I don't think it was on his to-do list to be burned by fire that day. I don't, you're trying to tell me he didn't have enough faith to get out of it? No, that's what God wanted to have happen. And Abinadi had enough faith to trust God that that was okay, even if by fire. I don't think John the Baptist wanted to have his head cut off, that that was the outcome, and he certainly believed in Jesus Christ. Faith is doing what God wants, when he wants it done, and how he wants it done, regardless of the outcome. Do we have enough faith like the Savior? Thy will be done. Yes, here's what I'd like. I'd love to have this blessing. I'd like to be cured of cancer. Nevertheless, may thy will be done. And if it is that we are not to be healed that way, 
and death is to come, do we have enough faith to accept that and still believe in him in the midst of that? See, there are too many. They pray and think that faith is just believing hard enough and you'll get your way. And then when they don't get the way, when the miracle doesn't come according to what the way they wanted, they become offended and they get mad at God and they leave this church. That's what you're setting yourself up for if you don't understand what faith is and living by faith. Faith is living by the will of God regardless of the outcome. If I am to go through this hideous disease, if I am to suffer this mental illness, and God's not going to take it away, at least in the way that I want him to, I will still stand by you, come what may. It is well with my soul regardless. Regardless of the outcome, God, I will follow you regardless of the outcome. That's faith. So one, that kind of faith will get us. That's who will abide the day of his coming. Number two, here's also who will abide. This is in Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. He says, gather yourselves together, yea, gather together. O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day pass as the chaff, before the fish anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Zephaniah is preaching specifically and referring specifically to the last days, the day of the Lord, when it will become hard. His judgments will be poured on. There will be horrific things that are and will continue to happen down there. And he says, do you want to be hid from that? Then seek meekness and righteousness. The meek shall inherit the earth. Well, so... That just begs the question, what is meekness? I've never heard it defined very much in the church. We talk a lot about it. It must be different than just humility, or God would not use both of them as two separate things. This is probably the best definition of what meekness is. Elder Alvin A. Dyer gave the following. I believe there is perhaps a distinction between humility and meekness. It may be said that meekness is a condition of voluntary humility. See, sometimes we humble our hearts because of circumstance. A tragedy happens, a life is lost, a death occurs, an illness comes to us, and, and we humble our hearts and we realize, oh, to get through this, I need God's help, so we humble ourselves. Meekness is I don't need any of those situations. I just voluntarily seek God's will. Voluntary humility. Zephaniah says, those are the ones who will abide the day of his coming. That's who will abide it. May we voluntarily seek to follow Christ and do his will, regardless of the outcome. President Joseph Fielding Smith said, when Christ comes a second time, it will be in the clouds of heaven, and it shall be the day of vengeance against the ungodly. When those who have loved wickedness and have been guilty of transgression and rebelled against the laws of God will be destroyed. All during the ministry of Christ, wickedness ruled and seemed to prevail. But when he comes in the clouds of glory, as it is declared in this message of Malachi to the world, and which was said by Moroni to be near at hand, then Christ will appear as a refiner and purifier of both man and beast and of all that pertains to this earth. For the earth itself shall undergo a change and receive its former paradisiacal glory. So, who will abide his coming? Adam said, those who have faith, live by faith, those who live by faith. That was Habakkuk. Zephaniah says, those who are meek and seek righteousness, 
those who voluntarily humble themselves, not compelled by circumstance. And then Joseph Finley Smith warns us that it is coming to the wicked, the judgments of God. Well, number three, who else? What Malachi now tells us, who will be able to abide this? Malachi chapter 3, verse 5, which says this, And I will come near to you to do judgments. Now here's who he will seek vengeance against. And I will be a swift witness against one, the sorcerer. Now, let, let's explain that. In Hebrew, that means those who worshiped and prayed to idols. Idol worship, idolatry. Now, sorcerers, we usually think of in terms of dark magic, enchantment, spells. It can include all that because you're worshiping something. You're praying unto something other than God. That's idolatry. But sorcerers means any idol worship and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, and the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear me not, saith the Lord of hosts. So you want to abide his coming? Do all the opposite of that. Worship only Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father. Do not commit adultery or idolatry, and do when you give your word and make oaths at a sacrament table or at altars in a temple, you keep them. You don't false swear. You don't false swear. And you do not oppress the poor, the widow, the fatherless, and the stranger. That's who also will abide his coming. Gospel principle. Those who have become meek and lowly in heart and following the Savior will, the Savior's will, and did not partake in idolatry, adultery, false swearing, and did not oppress the poor, the widow, the fatherless, and the stranger, will be able to abide the day of the Lord. We have been warned. You know the escape. If you decide not to take it, then do not blame God. Malachi 3, 5 through 18, further condemnation of Israel for wrongdoing. So let's take a look at some of those. Chapter 3, verse 5, the Lord and his judgment will be a swift witness against the sorcerer. We've talked about that. To whisper a spell or to enchant or practice magic. Who become numerous among his people after the Babylonian captivity, as they are today. Against the adulterer who are all too prevalent because of the influence of foreign peoples, against the false swearers or perjurers, or those who hold back the pay of poor men and defraud or oppress the widow and the orphan, and finally against those who thrust aside the foreigner, stranger, or guest, and fail in other ways to fear God. These indictments through Malachi show how alert and aware the prophet must have been of the social injustices among his people. Malachi knew, as did Amos, that men cannot worship God acceptably and be unjust to their fellows. To find God, a man must also find his neighbor and love them as himself, as the Savior will put it in the New Testament. Chapter 3, verse 6. The meaning seems to be, I have not changed, but you have not kept the part of the covenant you have not performed my words. That should help you with the meaning of verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 7. One of the signs of apostasy is turning away from God by turning away from his ordinances. Look what it says in Dr. Covenants 1, 14 through 15. And the arm of the Lord shall be revealed, and the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the, neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people, for they have strayed from mine ordinances, and have broken mine everlasting covenant. So, straying from the ordinances is a sign of, apo of apostasy. Chapter 3, verses 8 through 9. What in the ordinances Israel had turned away from was tithing, tithes and offerings. 
In ancient Israel, tithes were paid to the Lord for his servant, the Levites, who had been given no other inheritance. They in turn were tithed, and the proceeds were given to the priests. The offerings were of several varieties, such as bread and cake, the annual half shekel, and the tabernacle offerings, offerings for the simple temple when first erected. Here's what Eller Legrand Richards said. In addition to giving ourselves and giving our services, the Lord has asked us to give of our means and our substance. We have men in the church who give their time. They will go when they are asked to preach. They will perform a public duty. But it is hard to do the little duty that is seen in secret by them and God alone in their presiding office. And so we are asked to contribute our tithes and offerings, not only because the church needs money to build itself, for before there was an organization of the church, God introduced the principle of sacrifice in order that his servants and his children might be tested, that they should bring the best of their lands and of their herds, that they were burnt upon the altar of sacrifice, but the giving sanctified the souls of those who gave. Yes, God needs money to build up his church, but he also needs us to be tried and tested and to sanctify our souls. And tithes and offerings is one of the ways he does that, is what Elder Grand Richard is saying. Continuing his quote, And I want to say to you, my brothers and sisters, that we need the tithes of the saints in order that the kingdom might go on, for it shall be built just as rapidly as the faith of the saints can build it, and it is retarded when there is a lack of faith. Paying tithes and offerings has nothing to do with money and everything to do with faith. That's what we need in the church in order to build his kingdom, is faith. And tithes and offerings is one way to do that. Pain of tithes and offerings is tied to becoming pure in heart. Let me show you this. Remember, this is the famous, I'm, I'm not going over, we all know the quote. We're in, uh, Malachi accused them of robbing God. They said, where have we robbed thee? He says, in tithes and offerings. Yes, we're robbing God when we don't pay tithes. We're, we're, we're seeking to rob him through deceit. We think we can fool him and he won't notice. Kind of stupid, huh? But it's also tied to become pure in heart. Well, pure in heart is significant because only the pure in heart can Zion be built. Only those who are pure in heart can be in Zion. The celestial kingdom is a Zion. So you will not be able to inherit celestial kingdom or exaltation without being pure in heart. So let's see how these two are tied together. In Hebrew, there's a difference between a thief and a robber as used in Malachi. A thief is someone who takes something that's not his. Okay, they, they, You just take something that's not yours. That's what we normally think of. A robber as used in Malachi is one who tries to defraud by taking something that is not his through deceit. That's just different than just taking something straight up. You're trying to take something by deceit. So you appear as if you're righteous and you're still living the covenant. So you're trying to deceive Jehovah and not giving him what is his. So you're trying to defraud Jehovah of his money, of what's his, and you're trying to do it deceivingly, as if you're not doing it. That's what a robber is. That's what they're doing. That's what we're doing today when we don't pay tithing. We're trying to defraud Jehovah by deceit. Now, so here would be a clear translation of Malachi 3, 8 through 9. Will a man try to deceive God? Yet you have tried to defraud me through deceit. But you say, and where have we tried to defraud through deceit? in tithes and offerings. You're cursed with a curse, for you have tried to take what is mine through deceit, even this whole nation. See, that's a lot more stupid than just not paying tithing. You're trying to do it through deceit. You're trying to act as if you are still righteous. You're still an active member in the church. Well, you may be, but you're not an active member in the gospel. And so we're trying to deceive either God, others, or our priesthood leaders. Now, 
take a look at the connection. There's only one place in scripture I know of where it talks about what the pure in heart, where it defines who the pure in heart are. And that's in Psalms 24, 3 through 4. Let's read it. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? You're familiar with this, aren't you? Who will stand in his holy place? And now the psalmist answers. He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. And now he's, this is what parallelism is used in Hebrew poetry for. He's now going to repeat or tell us what clean hands and pure heart are. Okay. So he that hath clean hands is he who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity. Okay. Hands are things that we do, our actions. Our actions are not vain. They're not worthless. Okay. I'm living the gospel of substance. Not the worthless things of the world and chasing after the worst. Things that, will, uh, that are of no worth eternally. That's clean hands. Now what is a pure heart? He finishes. Nor sworn deceitfully. A person with a pure heart does not make oaths, vows, covenants deceitfully. They don't swear, give the word deceitfully, meaning, yes, I'll do that. And then they end up not doing it. Notice the connection deceitfully, don't pay tithing, you're robbing God through deceit. You don't go to the sacrament table, brothers and sisters, say amen, which is meaning you're making an oath to keep his commandments, that's what it says in there, right? And then you don't pay tithing, you are now a false swearer. You have just sworn deceitfully. Pain tithing can only be done by the pure in heart. The pure in heart are those who make vows and swear and keep their word. They don't try to deceive. Not pain tithing, you're trying to deceive. Brothers and sisters, making covenants and swearing to God is serious business. I would not partake of the sacrament and then not keep the commandments. I would not partake of the sacrament and then go home and abuse my wife or husband or children in whatever, whatever form. I would not partake of the sacrament and then think, well, I don't have to pay tithing. I can still be active. No, you're not pure in heart. And the pure in heart cannot dwell. In the, in, in, but the, those who are not pure in heart cannot dwell in the kingdom of God. So there's a direct link between pay and tithing with full purpose of heart and becoming pure in heart, keeping your word. In other words, Israel, you have made sacred covenants with me, have sworn to obey and follow me, Jehovah. However, you have sworn deceitfully by trying to defraud me, defraud me of what is mine through deception. Thus you have neither clean hand nor a or a pure heart. Therefore, you cannot come to my temple, stand in my holy place, or return and live in my kingdom. That's what Malachi is saying to them. Or in other words, Latter-day Saints, you, not, you cannot come to my church and make sacred covenants at the sacred altar of the sacrament table and then think you can try and defraud me through the deceit by not paying tithing. And in the words of Alma, imagine to yourselves that you can lie unto the Lord in that day and say, Lord, our works have been works of righteousness, or our works have been righteous works upon the face of the earth, and that he will save you? Really? You think you can partake the sacrament, not pay tithing, and then get back and say, Lord, I have done works of righteousness upon the earth. You really think you can deceive the Savior and do that? Well, try it out. See how it works for you. Good luck. I would not suggest it. If you make covenants and swear at the sacrament table and at the altar of temples, I would live up to every single one of those. Brothers and sisters, making and keeping sacred, keeping covenants and paying tithing is serious business. God will not be mocked. Yes, I am free to choose whether I pay tithe or not. However, 
I am not free to choose the consequences of those choices or how the consequences are given. See, we want that. We want to do that. One, we don't want any consequences. Or if there are going to be consequences, I want to choose what the consequences are. No, agency does not conclude any of that. You have the right to choose between life or death. That's it. Agency's done. That's as far as it goes. In the words of Miller Maxwell, we had better want the consequences of what we want. Gospel principle. One pays tithing because they have faith in Christ, not because they have money. Well, let's move on to chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. Malachi then implies that because they robbed God of these things, the blessings of the fields have been withheld from them. Huh. Well, that sounds like there may be catastrophes and things that wipe out the crops. And, and he didn't mention anything about climate change. He said it was because of disobedience. Hmm. Maybe. Maybe if we want to affect climate change, it has to do with our obedience. Well, that seems to be what Christ is implying here. The teaching that there is a relationship between man's service to God and the way in which the earth yields her fruit is most interesting. To Israel, ancient and modern, the Lord promised to open up you the windows of heaven and to pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. And we hear that all the time. On talks given, this is probably the most quoted scripture when talks are given on tithing, is it not? And then they quote this promise. Brothers and sisters, and the promise you'll receive is that the heavens, the windows of heaven will be opened. And then you think, well, what in the heck does that mean? Well, here's a more literal translation. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour you out a blessing that will never cease. That is, it will last for eternity. Brothers and sisters, you want blessings for eternity? You want to be blessed in exaltation for eternity? Then I would faithfully, with the right attitude, and with real intent, pay tithes and offerings. You will not receive exaltation without doing so. All material and spiritual blessings are his to give as he sees fit. Included in his blessings from heaven are revelations from him in one's personal life. All blessings are, of course, conditional. He desires to bless his faithful children abundantly. The devourer now, in verse, I think believe this is verse now, verse 11, the devourer may mean locusts and other pests to agriculture. But it may refer to Satan as well when he says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. I'll let your crops glow and stuff. But I will also devour, I will rebuke Satan for your sake. The Lord promised that the fruits of the ground and vine will not come forth ahead of their time when they would be of little or no value. The implication is that our efforts to provide for ourselves will be blessed and bear fruit in their seasons. Literal fruit as in food and spiritual fruit in their season. Because of the blessing that will come to the faithful, they will be recognized by the world around them, both individually and as people. The fruit of the ground could also, if we're, since we're taking this to mean figurative as, as real as literal, the, the, the devour saint will not be able to destroy the fruit in your ground, meaning my offspring. Paying tithing and offerings could be a big protection to our offspring, our families, and ward off Satan from us and protect us. Malachi 3, verses 13 through 15. It is, is it vain to serve the Lord? One truth about covenant relationships is that both parties must observe their promise in order to keep the covenant in force. Sometimes when those lacking faith lose promised blessings, they blame the Lord. You've probably seen that a lot. But the Lord is God. He never breaks a promise, so it couldn't be him that should be blamed. The difficulty as described by Malachi is that the critics of the Lord have twisted the truth, as they always do. The question the prophet 
the question the prophet stemming from observing the ordinances of the Lord and maintain that it is vain to serve God. They see inequity when the wicked prosper and those who work evil are ele elevated and they blame the Lord for permitting such things to exist. Their words are, thus their words of criticism are stout against their Lord. So you see the right, the wicked prospering, and they will for a season. That's just a part of mortality. And then we justify ourselves in thinking, well, it's vain to serve God. See, they get blessed, they don't serve him, so I'm better off doing that. That's just foolishness, ignorance, and I, I would just say <laughs> stupidity. You don't understand what blessings are. And what truly is important. Let's take a look at this. Here's what Spencer, President Spencer W. Kimball shared in conference one time, this experience. Some time ago, a sister said to me, Why is it, Brother Kimball, that those who do the least in building the kingdom seem to prosper most? We drive a Ford. Our neighbors drive a Cadillac. We observe the Sabbath, attend our meetings. They play golf, hunt, fish, and play. We abstain from the forbidden while they drink eat, drink, and are merry, and are unrestrained. We pay tithes and other church donations. They have their entire large income to lavish upon themselves. They are tied home with me. We are tied home with our large family of small children, often ill. They are totally free for social life, to dine and dance. We wear cottons and woolens, and I wear a three-season coat, but they wear silks and costly apparel and she wears a mink coat. Our meager income is always strained and never seems adequate for necessities, while their wealth seems enough to allow them even luxury. And yet the Lord promises blessings to the faithful. It seems to me that it does not pay to live the gospel, that the proud and the covenant breakers are the ones who prosper. See, she is making the same mistake that they're now saying to Malachi. This is a modern-day example of what the people were saying to Malachi. And if I was Malachi, I'd report back and say, you Ignorant, stupid people. This is why I'm not a prophet, because I would have said that. And that wouldn't have been good. But it's true, you ignorant, stupid people. Why do you think having sexual immorality, having a Cadillac, being able to break the Sabbath, being able not to have kids, are blessings? See the warped view we get? Those aren't blessings. Brothers and sisters, the things I cherish are one, my relationship with Jesus Christ and my Father in heaven. Two, my relationship with my spouse and my children and the love we share. That's a blessing. And three, the peace and joy I receive by following God's will through living the gospel covenant. Really? You think mink coats and Cadillacs are blessings? If that's as shallow as you are, God help you. She had missed the whole point of the gospel and focused on those things and was deceived by Satan. Focused on the things of the world, thinking that's what it's all about. See how good Satan is? Well, I'll finish in Elder Kimble, President Kimball's talk. Then I said to her, Yours is an ancient question. Job and Jeremiah made the same complaint. And I quote for I quoted for her the Lord's answer through Malachi. And then he quotes Malachi four, one through two. Then I said to the discon disconsolate sister, But for many rewards you need not wait until the judgment day. You have many blessings today. You have your family of lovely, righteous children. You're trying to tell me a Cadillac and a mink coat? You would rather have that than righteous children loving you for eternity? Really? really? How could someone be so demented to think that? Continuing President Kimball. He didn't say that in the talk, but it was me. What a rich reward for so-called sacrifices. The blessings that you enjoy cannot be purchased 
with all your neighbor's wealth. And so it is. Boy, brothers and sisters, let's get perspective. Let's figure out what this gospel is. And then Satan can't deceive us as he deceived this poor sister. Gospel principle. Any of God's children who are obedient to his laws will receive the accompanying blessings associated with the law kept in his way and on his timetable. Thus true followers of Christ will never seek or find him in vain. Malachi 3.16, what is the book of remembrance mentioned in this verse? Those who devote themselves to the Lord earn for themselves the privilege of having their names recorded in the Lamb's book of life. This sacred book of remembrance, verse 16, is kept in heaven and contains the names of the faithful children of the Father in heaven, or in other words, those who are his precious jewels. This is not figurative, brothers. This is literal. He will literally open up the book of life. If your name's not in it, guess where you're not going? They are those who will inherit eternal life. For this book contains the names of the sanctified, even them of the celestial world. You cannot pay tithe and expect your name to be in the book either. Those whose names are written there and who afterwards return to sinful ways will have their names blotted out from the book. That's what excommunication means, blotted out. Ella Bruce R. McConkie explained, Adam kept a written record, I'm sorry, written account of his faithful descendants in which he recorded their faith and works, their righteousness and devotion, their revelations and visions, their adherence to the revealed plan of salvation. To signify the importance of honoring our worthy ancestors and hearkening to the great truths revealed to them, Adam called his record a book of remembrance. It was prepared according to the pattern given by the finger of God. This is a literal book, brothers and sisters. This is not figurative. Similar records have been kept by the saints in all ages. Many of our present scriptures have come down to us because they were first written by prophets who were following Adam's pattern of keeping a book of remembrance. The church keeps record, similar records today, see section 85, and urges its members to keep their own personal and family books of remembrance. Let's now turn to Malachi chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. In that day when I make up my jewels, what does that mean? His jewels. Jewels is from the Hebrew word segula, meaning a personal possession or property that is treasured. It's something that you own, you have ownership of, okay? that, that, that you treasure, and it's, and it's your personal property. So with that in mind, uh, let's, let, let, let's re, reword, let's read this 7 through 18 and put this, this translation into what this word means. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my personal possessions. Okay? That's who belongs to the Lord. And I will spare them, those whom I personally possess, those whom I own, is what he's saying. As a man spareth his own son that serveth him. So the gospel principle is, can we let the Savior own us and be his personal possession? That means if you let the Savior own you, you will do whatever he asks or say. says, now, I'm not using this word as a pejorative, but in a sense, are you willing to be a slave unto Christ? It's better being a slave to Satan. We're going to be a slave to somebody. We're going to follow somebody or something. We might as well have something is going to own us. We might as well let it be the Savior who owns us. That's who will be Jesus Christ. Those of us in the church who are willing to be owned by the Savior, which means I will do whatever he asks, whenever he asks it, and how he ever asks it, regardless of the outcome. Can you and I let the Savior own us? See, the beauty is he'll never be a harsh taskmaster. Let's 
chapter 4 now, verses 1 through 2, what does it mean by the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings? This seems to be he's prophesying of the future Messiah, of the Savior to come, and that he'll have healing in his wings. This is a future prophecy. Well, let's see how this was literally fulfilled. What wings does the Savior have? Wings in Hebrew is from the Hebrew word kanaf, meaning edge or extremity. So, for example, of a bird, its edge or extremity would be the end of its wing. So that's why they call it a wing. That's the end. That's the edge, right, of the bird. Well, the wing of a robe, meaning what's the extremity of a person's robe, would be the hem. And so now let's take how this was literally fulfilled. Anciently, in the book of Numbers, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the border a ribbon of blue. You can see the image on the left. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them. And that you seek not after your own heart or your own eyes after which you used to go a whoring, that you may remember and do all the commandments. Be going to the Lord. So I want you to wear this blue thread on the hem of your garment to remind you that all commandments come from me. My will is heavenly sent and that you will commit to follow me. That you won't go after your own eyes. You will keep my commandments. In other words, you will follow my will. That's what the commandments are. The commandments, the Ten Commandments are ten things of God's will. Keeping them is following the will of God. Okay, so that's what that represented. So they had that reminder in their head. So they walked around, they saw people, and they would look down, they'd say, oh, yes, follow God's will, follow God's will, that's from heaven. Keep the commandments, keep the commandments. Well, now let's take a look. See, that means Jesus would have worn a robe that had this blue thread on it. Matthew chapter 4, 14, I'm sorry, chapter 14, verses 34 to 36. Listen to the account. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, that's Jesus, they sent out into all the country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased. And they besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. Notice it wasn't just to touch his garment. They purposely were touching the hem, the wing of the garment. See, the hem's the wing, right? The far edge, the extremity. And as many as touched it were made perfectly whole. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all of her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. Remember her? She was also touched the hem. This is in Luke 8, 30, 43 to 44. This is now that woman. And a woman having issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of her of any, came unto him and touched the border of his garment, the edge, the wing of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched me. It stopped. I mean, I suggest you what they're grabbing is the blue thread. And that grabbing symbolized, I will follow you only. I covenant to do your will and keep the commandments. That's what heals us. It's him. He literally came with healing in his wings. The wing of his robe, the far end, the hem. They would touch the wing of his garment and they got healed. Isn't that beautiful? It literally happened. Gospel principle. This is quoting 3 Nephi 9, 13 and 20. O ye that are spared, because you were more righteous than they, will you not now return unto me, repent of your sins, and be converted, that I may heal you? That's how we get healed, is submitting to his will. 
and ye shall offer up for a sacrifice unto me a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And whosoever cometh unto me with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, him will I baptize with fire and with the Holy Ghost, even as the Lamanites, because of their faith in me at the time of their conversion, were baptized with fire and with the Holy Ghost, and they knew it not. Brothers and sisters, Please don't misunderstand Christ healing physically of their infirmities. All that was was symbolic of that I can heal you spiritually. I can forgive you. You can be forgiven. Your sins can be covered by and through my blood of the atonement. That's the healing we want. I think it was President Harold B. Lee who said, the greatest miracles I see in this church are not the healing of bodies. It is the healing of sick souls which we all have. Tell me, really, if you had a choice, cure my cancer or heal me, then I'll be in exaltation. Which one would you choose? Oh my gosh, that's not even a choice, is it? I'll live with the cancer if I'm guaranteed exaltation. And you'll heal me of my sins. And so he came with healing in his wings. Let's do the final chapter, Malachi 5, 5 through 6, the coming of Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Prior to and at the coming of our Lord, the world would be visited with sorrow, distress, and devastation. Malachi states this fact in the following words. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and that day shall come, shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor or branch. It's a literal fire. It will literally kill them. The story goes that someone asked Joseph Fielding Smith, president of the church, is it really real fire that will come down? Is it just symbolic? He said, well, it was real water in the flood, wasn't it? When Moroni was explaining this verse to the prophet Joseph Smith, he quoted it with a little variation from that given. The lines were changed and read as follows. And all they that do wickedly shall burn as stubble, for they shall, for they that come shall burn them. See, the, it's the coming of Christ that causes the fire. You cannot be in God's presence, spiritually or physically, unless you're purified. This verse in question is alluded to in the Doctrine and Covenants at least three times. Section 29, verse 9, verse 24, section 133, verse 64. And in every instance, the Lord explains it as having to do with the judgment, judgments to be poured out upon the wicked at the time of his second advent. Doctrine, 60, Doctrine 64, 23 through 24 is a good illustration. Behold, now it is called today the coming of the Son of Man, and verily it is a day of sacrifice, a day of the tithing of my people. For he that is tithed shall not be burned at his coming. For after today cometh, the burning is is speaking after the manner of the Lord. Verily I say, tomorrow all the proud and they that do wickedly shall be as stubble. I will burn them up, for I am the Lord of hosts. I will not spare any that remain in Babylon. And just for context, when he says tithing, used in section 64, the law of tithing as far as giving a 10% that we know that we practice today is not what they were practicing. They would give all that was left over that they had left over. That's what they tithed. Elder Theodore M. Burton said, When Malachi prophesied for the second coming of Christ, he spake of the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly. Of whom was he speaking? First, of those who rejected Christ because of the pride of their hearts, and second, of those who, having accepted Jesus, were not valiant in keeping his commandments. Malachi went on to say that they shall burn as stubble. This means they shall be destroyed. By whom? Malachi explains. They that come shall burn them, saith the Lord of hosts. The prophet then turns to the unhappy state of the wicked and gives in some figurative language a picture of the fortunate situation of the righteous. But unto you that fear my name... Shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings? And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves to the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts, 
That's the blessing of those who fear his name, who reverence his name, who take upon themselves his name and follow his name in all things, regardless of the outcome. Malachi 4.6, Elijah and the promises made to the fathers. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers. At least I come and smite the earth with a curse. When the angel Moroni quoted this part of Malachi, he did so with the changes as follows. Here's how Moroni quotes this verse. Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers. And the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. That's in the document of history of the church, volume 1, page 12, that we know. Joseph records. Well, as Sidney B. Sperry said, the mission of Elijah has to do with the higher spiritual functions of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Elijah was the last prophet to hold the keys of the sealing powers of the priesthood. That is, that is, I apologize, that is, to seal in heaven what is bound upon the earth. The spirit of Elijah implies the power to invoke a fullness of priesthood. The prophet Joseph Smith states it in this way. The spirit power and calling of Elijah is that ye have power to hold the key of the revelation, ordinances, oracles, powers, and endowments of the fullness of the Melchizedek priesthood and of the kingdom of God on earth, and receive, obtain, and perform all the ordinances belonging to the kingdom of God, even unto the turning of the hearts of the fathers unto the children, and the hearts of the children unto the fathers, even those who are in heaven. Through the powers of the priest given to Elijah, men and women may be sealed to each other in marriage for time and eternity in the temples of God. Children born of these unions may be claimed by their parents forever, since the latter, day, latter are united by an everlasting covenant. The family organization thus continues beyond the grave. The one generation is thus sealed to the other back to the days of Adam. Families that have passed into the spirit world without a knowledge of the gospel and hence without being sealed to each other must have the work done vicariously for them in the temples of the Lord. All of the gospel ordinances that are necessary to be performed for the living persons to obtain salvation must also be performed for the dead. The Lord has made no exceptions other than for the children who die under the age of eight years. This is the reason why the fathers, the dead, spoken in Malachi 4 or 6, turn to their children, their living descendants who have all the gospel ordinances from baptism to marriage performed by carelessly for them in the temples. Our dead look towards us, right? Our hearts are turned to us. Look, I'm waiting. If the children do not turn their hearts to their ancestors and perform this work for them, it will make it impossible for the Lord to accomplish his purposes of making this earth a celestial abode of the righteous. Blessed are the meek, said the Lord, for they shall inherit the earth. In consequence of default in performing the ordinances required, the only course left for the Lord would be to smite the earth with a curse. The earth will not fulfill the measure of its creation to become exaltation and a celestial kingdom for those worthy to abide there. Without the sealing powers, you can't have that kind of kingdom. Then we've wasted our whole time down here. Joseph Smith said, continuing, I wish you to understand this subject, for it is important, and if you receive it, this is the spirit of Elijah, that we redeem our dead and connect ourselves with our fathers which are in heaven, and seal up our dead to come forth in the first resurrection. And here we want the power of Elijah to seal those who dwell on earth to those who dwell in heaven. This is the power of Elijah and the keys of the kingdom of Jehovah. President Joseph Finley Smith said, What was the promise made to the fathers that was to be fulfilled in the latter days by turning of the hearts of the children to their fathers? It was the promise of the Lord made through Enoch, Isaiah, and the prophets to the nations of the earth. 
that the time should come when the dead should be redeemed, and the turning of the hearts of the children is fulfilled in the performing of the vicarious temple work and in the preparation of their genealogies. Commenting on the meaning of turning the hearts, Joseph Smith said, Now, the word turn here should be translated bind or seal. But what is the object of this important mission? Or how is it to be fulfilled? The keys are to be delivered. The spirit of Elijah is to come. The gospel to be established. The saints of God gathered. Zion built up. And the saints to come up as saviors on Mount Zion. The sublime mission of Elijah to return and restore the keys of his power before the great and just day of the Lord was duly fulfilled on April 3, 1836, when he appeared to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in the Kirtland Temple. This is section 110. Here is their description of that notable appearance. Elijah the prophet, who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before us and said, Behold, the time has fully come which was spoken by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he, Elijah, should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord come. Turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. Therefore the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands, and by this you may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors." Doctrine and Covenants, section 2, verse 1 through 3, says it this way, Behold, I reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promise made to the fathers and the hearts of the fathers of the children to turn to their fathers. We've explained all of that. But then he, and then he puts it this way, If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. Brothers and sisters, if we cannot seal up people for time and all eternity and to live in exaltation as family units, then this whole time down here was a waste of time. That is one of the whole sole purposes of mortality. And to become like God, I must be sealed to my spouse and my family if I am going to dwell in exaltation because that is the condition on which the Father and the Son dwell and live under. And those who have died without having this need a way because they got to perform it themselves. And so we perform that vicariously in temples. If this was not permitted to happen, if we did not have this work, then we have wasted our whole time down here. So by extension, you could say this phrase. If you do not go to the temple and honor your temple covenants, then you're wasting your time. Please. Honor the temple, make covenants there, and keep them. Be temple worthy, or you're just wasting your time down here. Without the singing powers of God and Elijah brought back to earth, this mortal experience would have been a waste of time. Gospel principle. The coming of Elijah in the latter days enables eternal families and the earth from becoming a curse and a waste. So it's up to us whether our life will be a curse and a waste or we'll be blessed for eternity and we'll all be linked to the temple. Well, thank you for watching this presentation on Malachi. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button and please consider subscribing to the channel. Thank you.